Howdy folks. What we're going to talk about in this video is we are going to go over a subject called one sample hypothesis testing. Okay, I'm going to show you a, uh, what I have broken out into a six step uh, procedure for testing a hypothesis using one sample. Now later on we're going to do two sample hypothesis testing and it works off this same basic framework. So if you understand this framework you shouldn't have a problem when we get to two sample hypothesis testing. Okay, but uh, basically uh, hypothesis testing is something that's very important in science. If you ever learned the scientific method, you probably learned at some point or another that after you make a hypothesis about some kind of scientific thing about people or societies or animals or, you know, uh, I don't know, chemicals, whatever it is, uh, once you make a hypothesis that the next thing you would do or one of the next things you would do is you would test your hypothesis to see if it is uh, consistent with the evidence that we have. And uh, that is what I'm going to show you how to do here. I'm, I'm not going to show you how to gather data. I am going to show you how to test your data to see if it uh, passes uh, a test of what we call a test of significance. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through each one of these steps one by one and explain the idea behind the step and then how to do the step. So the very first step is probably the hardest one. I say hardest one, meaning it's going to take the most time to explain. Uh, step one says state the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay. So what I want to do right now is I'm going to put up a, de a couple definitions right here. I'm going to put up some definitions of null hypothesis and a definition of alternative hypothesis. All right. So here's our definition of null hypothesis. Uh, before I read it, I just want to explain that typically what we're doing in hypothesis testing is we are comparing populations of things. So for example, we might be comparing the population of people who use one particular uh, bar of soap to the population of people that use a different bar of soap. Uh, here's a, an example that you might consider. Let's say that most headache medicines like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, they might make your headache go away in about 30 minutes. And all the people who take Tylenol, which is acetaminophen, uh, that, uh, so all the people who would take Tylenol for a headache, that is a population of people. Let's say that there's another medicine introduced and that medicine claims that they, that their medicine makes, uh, can make your headache go away faster than Tylenol can make your headache go away. So that medicine, all the people who take that medicine would be a population of people. And what we would be doing is we would be comparing the population of people that take the new medicine to the population of people that might take Tylenol or Advil or something like that. Okay. So think about that. The idea that we're comparing populations in a hypothesis test. So here's the null hypothesis. A null hypothesis is the standard assumption that the population that we are studying, for example, the people taking the new medication, that the population we are studying is no different than the other populations in the absence of statistical support. So here's what we're saying is given that we don't have any statistical support, any statistical analysis, we are going to assume that two populations that may be different are actually the same population. We're going to assume they're the same population until we have a reason to believe otherwise. And we're going to need some statistical evidence to show us that they are different. For example, let's say that there is a biologist that comes across an animal and it looks like another animal. Let's say that it looks a lot like a rat. Okay. And so they assume, uh, well, at first they look at it and they say, well, wow, that looks a lot like a rat, but they might notice a few differences between the animal they're looking at and a rat. And so they may suspect, and we're going to get to that word in just a minute. They may suspect that maybe this animal actually is not a rat. So they find this population or they find several examples of that animal 
from the population of that animal, and then we have the population of rats. And until any kind of scientific statistical evidence is found, we would assume, and that scientist should assume, that this animal they found and the population of rats are the same population. The null hypothesis is that the two populations are actually the same population. Okay, So that's what a null hypothesis is. It is the standard assumption. It is the starting assumption. As scientists, we are going to say, well, we're going to assume that it's the same until we have a reason to believe that it's different. Okay, And so that's what a null hypothesis is. Now I'm going to put up a definition of alternative hypothesis. All right, so here's our definition of alternative hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is the standard assumption that two populations are the same, that the population we're studying is basically the same as another population, well, then the alternative hypothesis is going to say basically the opposite. An alternative hypothesis is the idea or suspicion. We suspect something may be different. The idea or suspicion that the population we are studying is very different from other populations. And so we're now going to make a hypothesis. I see this rat here, and I think that it's actually, it's not really a rat. It's actually very different from a rat. Looks a little bit like a rat, but I think it has qualities that separates it from a rat. And so I'm going to put forth a hypothesis that this animal is a different animal from the rat. And so uh, I can now proceed with gathering data to find out whether it is indeed different. And then if the results of all that testing is sufficient, I can conclude possibly that it is indeed a different animal. But if all the testing I do doesn't show much of a difference between the rat and this other animal, kind of shows them very similar, then I would go with the null hypothesis, that they're actually not very different at all. Okay? And so the idea of stating the null and alternative hypotheses is the idea that we have to, we have to make two separate statements when we're creating a hypothesis. One of those hypotheses is that there's no difference, and the other hypothesis is that there is a difference. Okay? And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to write a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Okay, before I write a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, I want to work with an example that, uh, that we, so that we can show you how the hypothesis or how the hypotheses go from the brain, the idea that you're working with, onto the paper. Okay, So let's say that we're dealing with the situation of the medicine. Let's say that the average amount of time that it takes for a headache to go away when somebody takes headache medicine is 30 minutes. That that's the average. And there's a new medicine, and they argue, they say, our medicine will get your headache to go away faster. What does faster mean? Well, faster means in less time, right? So if 30 minutes is how long it takes for a regular medicine for your, to make your headache go away, 30 minutes, then faster would be less than 30 minutes. And so our alternative hypothesis would say, well, this medicine is different. It will make your headache go away in less than 30 minutes. And so to state a null hypothesis, and an alternative hypothesis, what we'll do is we will write th this. We'll write H sub 0. That's for the null hypothesis, H sub 0. Now, there's different ways that you can do this depending on your, your instructor or your teacher uh, or your particular school uh, that you're in. Some people say uh, H naught, N-A-U-G-H-T, H uh, naught. And so um, I say H sub O or H sub zero. I especially like H sub zero because it reminds me of the video game Mortal Kombat with the character sub zero with the little freeze ray, right? Okay. So anyway, so let's say H sub O or H sub zero. This is going to represent the null hypothesis, which we'll write right here. Right under it, 
we're going to write H sub A. H sub A is the alternative hypothesis. And what we're doing with these hypotheses is we are making a claim suggesting our suspicion about a population. And so, if we're making a claim about the population, we want to use a population parameter. And what we're going to use is we're going to use the population mean, which is mu. So we're going to hypothesize that mu, remember the Greek letter mu? That mu is less than 30. What we're saying here is this. We're making a claim where we have a suspicion or we're hypothesizing, we're guessing that the average amount of time that it takes for a person's headache to go away will be less than 30 minutes. The population mean, the population of people who are taking the new medicine, on average, that their headache will go away in less than 30 minutes. Now, we don't know this for sure. We are hypothesizing it. We're doing this before we gather data. We're guessing. We're saying we think that their headache will go away in less than 30 minutes. And so now the alternative hypothesis would be that there's no difference. And so that's going to be mu is, if it's not less than, then the only possi other possibility is greater than or equal to 30. And the, nu the null hypothesis is always precisely the, uh, the opposite, so to speak. Everything that's not included in the alternative hypothesis is then included in the null hypothesis. So if the alternative hypothesis is considering all values less than 30, then the, then the null hypothesis has to include all numbers greater than 30 and include 30 itself. Okay? So if our statistical data supports that the average is less than 30, then, we, then we're happy that we have support for the alternative hypothesis. But if our data support shows that there's not really any difference, then we would just go ahead with the null hypothesis and say that the people who are taking the new medicine basically have their headache go away in about the same amount of time as if you took Advil or Tylenol or something like that. Okay, So this is stating the null and alternative hypothesis. But actually, there's three ways to state the null and alternative hypothesis. In this class, I have tried to get your brains accustomed to understanding something in three different ways. If you recall, we've done probabilities and proportions in three ways. We've done the less than probabilities, we've done the greater than probabilities, and we've done the between probabilities, right? Well, these hypotheses, the, there's basically three ways for now, for now, there's three ways to write a hypothesis. This one is the less than hypothesis. But we could also just as easily write the hypothesis as greater than. What if somebody claimed, hey, that medicine over there, it, it doesn't make your headache go away very fast. When I take Tylenol or Advil, my headache goes away faster. But when I take that medicine over there, the new medicine, it actually takes longer for my headache to go away. So now they're going to do uh, a study, a scientific study, and their hypothesis is that when you take that medicine, it takes longer, more than 30 minutes for your headache to go away. And so then for that person, their alternative hypothesis is that the average amount of time that it takes for your headache to go away for the population of people who take that other medicine is greater than 30 minutes. And then the null hypothesis H sub zero would be mu is less than or equal to 30. And so this is another way, a second way to frame uh, the uh, alternative hypothesis and the null hypothesis. Okay? And then there's a third way. And the third way we would say, let's see here. So let's talk about the animal. I'm going to switch up examples here. Remember how we said 
uh, let's say there's a biologist and he finds this other animal. And that biologist doesn't need to show that this new animal is greater than or less than. This biologist really just needs to show that the animal is different from a rat or whatever the animal is. Different from. So, same as or different from. Mathematically, we have a symbol that represents the same as. When two things, when one thing is the same as something else, it is equal. And so the null hypothesis is that the two things are equal. Whereas the alternative hypothesis would be that the, the thing is not equal. Okay? And so this is how I would write that. And let's say that it was the same number 30. The alternative hypothesis would be mu is not equal to 30, and the null hypothesis would be that mu is equal to 30. And what we'll often say in this situation with the, uh, with the equal or not equal is the question may say they're doing a study and they want to see whether or not a particular population mean is um, is, let's say, is 30 or not 30? It's 30 or not. Well, this is 30 or not 30. This is the kind of hypothesis that you would frame if you, um, if you had that kind of a research question. So basically, we can state our null and alternative hypothesis in one of three ways. We are either hypothesizing that a population mean is less than a number, that the population mean is greater than a number, or that the population mean is different from a number. And that is step one, state the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay? Okay, step two in this uh, one sample hypothesis test says, uh, is this test a left tail test, a right tail test, or is it a two tail test? And this idea of tails comes from the idea of the normal distribution. Let me, call, let me draw a normal distribution curve over here. It actually doesn't have to be the normal distribution curve, but some kind of distribution curve can also be the T distribution. And note that this distribution curve has two tails. Now when we say tail, we're not talking about like the tail of a squirrel or the tail of a bird, but more like the tail of a lizard, right? See this right here? See the left side of this curve right here? Doesn't that look kind of like a tail? Do you see that? It looks like the tail of a dinosaur or a lizard. And there's also another one over here. It gets really tiny here. This is a tail. So this distribution curve, it has two tails. It has a tail on the left side, and it has a tail on the right side. There are two tails, a left tail and a right tail. Note that the left tail is on the side of the curve where we are less than. And the right tail is on the right side of the distribution curve where all the probabilities are greater than. And that's important to understand. And here's what I want to show you is that whether your, whether your problem is a left tail test, a right tail test, or a two tail test is based on your hypothesis. It's based on your alternative hypothesis. So if you look at this hypothesis right here, this is a less than hypothesis. And because it's a less than hypothesis, this one is a left tail test. And that means it's only one tail. A left tail test is a one tail test. This one right here, this says mu is greater than. A greater than hypothesis is a right tail test. Okay? And a right tail test, that's one tail. Because look, the curve has two tails, but we're only picking the right side tail. That's a one tail test. And then lastly, if you're uh, alternative hypothesis is the one with the not equal to. This is a two-tail test. It is both the left tail and the right tail. And so step two very simply says, is this a left tail, right tail, or two-tail test? Well, that's going to be based on whatever you said in the first one, whatever your hypotheses are that you set up. Now, 
Step three of our procedure says state the level of significance and the p-value. Now, in science, if you are the researcher and you're doing the research study and you're a doctor in some university doing a research study or you work for some company and you're doing a research study, you are going to select the level of significance and it's going to be based on how sure, how confident you want to be in your results, how confident you are in the significance of your results. And that's why it's called the level of significance. In this class, in my class, and in, in most cases with, with uh, uh, whatever class you're in, your instructor or your teacher is going to tell you what the level of significance is on a particular problem. And so in most cases, you're just at this level of learning statistics, you're just going to be told what the level of significance is. And so let's say you're doing a problem and the question says, test this population at the 0.05 level of significance, okay? So let's say that it's 0.05. Well, based on the 0.05 level of significance, that's going to uh, tell you a few things, and I want to explain what the level of significance means. We call it the alpha, and when I say alpha, I mean the Greek letter alpha, and it's related to beta. In statistics, there are these two kinds of errors that we deal with. One of them is called an alpha error, and the other one is called a beta error. Now, an alpha error is the likelihood, it's the, it, the kind of error that's an alpha error is the error associated with rejecting the null hypothesis and being wrong that you rejected the null hypothesis. All right, let me say it like this. If you reject the null hypothesis, you're basically saying that the two populations are different. But what if the populations are actually the same? What if you've got this other weird animal and you've got a rat and you conclude this animal is different? It's a new species. But you're wrong. It was actually a rat the whole time. If you concluded that it was different, but it was actually the same the whole time, you committed an alpha error. Okay, that's an alpha error. On the alternative, a beta error is a situation where you don't reject the null hypothesis. You're looking at this other animal, and you're looking at the rat, and you say, eh, ah, they're basically the same. I did all these tests, and this animal really has all the same qualities as a rat, so they are the same, and I am not going to reject the null hypothesis. But then later you find out that the animal actually is very different. It's a completely different species, but because of the test that you did, you didn't reveal that it was a different species. You just committed a beta error, sometimes called this alpha error, is sometimes called a type one error, and the beta error is often called a type two error. Okay? So what we typically do is we try to minimize the type 1 error. We try to minimize the type 1 error. We want to minimize the likelihood that we're going to reject the null hypothesis and then be wrong. And that's just a judgment call on the part of science. In the world that we live in, based on our values for science, it is our judgment call that we would rather accidentally call two populations the same than to call them different. So we try to minimize the alpha error. And the way we minimize the alpha error is we make the level of significance, the alpha, smaller. Oftentimes we go with 0.05, but we can also go with 0.02 or 0.01. I suppose in certain industries they might go with 0.10 or 0.15. It really depends on what industry you're in or where you're doing research. Okay? So, but let's just say that your, the, the level of significance is 0.05, so what you would write is alpha is equal to 0.05. Well, this alpha error is going to indicate the p-value that you're going to look for in the t-table or the z-table or whatever, whatever other table that you're looking up numbers in. Okay, So the p-value is uh, associated with the alpha, and I'm going to show you how. Now, I'm going to give, show you something right here that's going to go with the Z-test. But 
When we do the T test, I'm going to change it up just a little bit, but I'll show you how it changes up. Basically speaking, if you are doing a, a left, if you're doing a left tail test, then your P is simply equal to whatever the alpha is. So if your alpha is 0.05, your P, your P value is 0.05. If you're doing a right tail test, then your P value is going to be equal to one minus alpha, which makes sense because every time up till this point, you've been doing a greater than problem. When you found a P value as your answer, you've been subtracting that P value from one, right? That's assuming you're using the table that, I, that I'm using, okay? Uh, so then a two-tail test, for a two-tail test, the way that you identify the p-value is you divide the alpha. That's not a very good alpha. Let's fix that alpha. Divide the alpha, also not that great. Let's get rid of that part of it. Divide the alpha by two. So if the level of significance was 0.05 and it was a left-tail test, then your p-value would be 0.05. If your level of significance was 0.05 and it was a right tail test, then you would do 1 minus 0.05 and your p-value would be 0.95. If you were doing a two tail test and your alpha was 0.05, then your p-value would be equal to 0.05 divided by 2, which is 0.025. Okay? And that is step three, stating the level of significance and identifying the p-value. All right, now we're going to briefly talk about step four, selecting the test statistic. Now, it depends on how far you've gotten and what you have learned already in your statistics class. But in my class, at this point, you have only learned two kinds of test statistics. You have learned about the z-score and you have learned about the t statistic, okay? So the, the Z and the T, okay? And what you have learned so far really is that there's only one thing that tells you whether you should use the Z or the T, and that is the sample size. And so when you select the test statistic, you're just going to look at the sample size. If N is greater than 30, if you have a sample size that is larger than 30, then you are going to select the Z statistic. If your sample size is less than or equal to 30, you are going to select the T statistic. But this can also, this is a judgment call, and this can be affected by whoever you do research for or whatever, whatever subject you do research in. This could change. There, you could be in a school or an industry that has a different rule for selecting the Z statistic or the T statistic. And so you have to be sensitive to that. But in my class, you're going to choose the Z statistic if the sample size is larger than 30, and you're going to choose the T statistic if the sample size is less than or equal to 30. All right, now here's a big one. We're going to do step five. In step five, here's what you're going to do. And there are all these parts of step five are related to each other. You're going to identify the critical value of the test statistic. That's going to come from the Z table or from the T table. And, and it depends on whether, on step four, whether you are doing a Z test or a T test. Okay? So the critical value is going to come from the Z table or the T table. Then you are going to sketch the distribution curve and you're going to shade what's called the rejection region. And then lastly, you are going to state the decision rule. That's three things. So I'm going to show you all those right now. Okay. So the first part of step five is identify the critical value. We're going to call that Z crit if it's a Z, if it's a Z test, if it's a T test, we're going to call it T crit. That's the critical T value or the critical Z value. This value is the cutoff score for whether you're going to reject the null hypothesis or not reject the, whole not, the, the null hypothesis. Okay? Uh, so 
Uh, the way you're going to get the, Z, the critical Z-score or the critical T-score is going to be based on, this is ba in the Z-score, it's going to be based on the P-value from step three. So whatever the P-value is in step three, you're going to do a reverse lookup and get the Z-value. The That's your critical Z-value. If it's a critical T-value, that is based on two things. It's based on your P-value and your degrees of freedom, which you just recently learned about. So it's what you have already been doing. You've already been looking up Z-scores based on P-values. You've already been looking up T-values uh, based on P-values and degrees of freedom. And, that, and you're doing the exact same thing. It's not new. Okay. So now, the next part says sketch the distribution curve and shade the rejection region. And you have three possibilities here. Here's one, two, you're just going to do a little sketch of a bell curve. Doesn't have to be a perfect sketch. If it's a left tail test, you're going to kind of draw a, a, a line over here, a cutoff line, and you're going to shade in the left tail. If it's a right tail test, you're going to do the same thing, but you're going to do it on the other side. You're going to draw a line here, and then you're going to shade in the right tail. If it's a two-tail test, you're going to do, this, do it to both sides. You're going to shade the left tail, and you're going to shade the right tail. Okay? And on this line right here, you are going to write whatever the critical value is. You're going to write the critical z-score. Z but I'm writing z-crit, but you're going to write a number. Now, on a left tail test, it's going to be a negative critical uh, z, a negative z-score. In a right tail test, it's going to be a positive critical z-score or t-score. And on a two-tail test, you're going to have the same value on both sides. One of them is going to be negative, and the other one's going to be positive. So you're either going to have a negative z and a positive z, or a negative t and a positive t. So two-tail tests require that you have plus or minus. So if, when you're calculating your critical t and your critical z, if it's a two-tail test, you're going to put plus or minus on it. If it's a left tail test, you're just going to put a negative. And if it's a right tail test, it's going to be a positive value, but you don't have to write the, pos the plus if it's just a positive value. Okay? All right, so identify the critical value, sketch the distribution curve, and shade the rejection region, and then state the decision rule. And here's what you're going to say. You are going to write, reject H sub O if, and you're going to say one of three things. You're either going to say if, if it's a Z-score, you're going to put a Z. If it's a T-score, you're going to put a T. If Z is less than, and then you're going to put the, Z, the critical Z value here. You're going to write a number here, whatever the critical Z value is. If it's a less than, it's going to be a negative, okay? If it is a right tail test, you're going to write Z, reject H sub O if Z is greater than the critical Z value. And if it's a two tail test, you're actually going to write reject H sub, H sub O if, and you're going to write both of these. You're going to write if Z is less than this number and if Z is greater than this number. And that's step five. We're going to do an example in just a little bit, so you'll, I, I think you'll get the hang of it. All right, last step in our uh, one sample hypothesis test procedure. Step six says calculate the test statistic and make a decision. And making a decision means making a decision based on the decision rule. Okay? So calculating the test statistic goes like this. If it's a Z or a T, the formula is the same. And it's a formula that you have already been using for the past few weeks, okay? And it involves the standard error, and it involves X bar, and it involves mu, okay? The formula is X bar, which should be given to you in the problem, or if you're doing the research, you have taken a sample and you've calculated the mean of that sample. So you have an X bar, right? X bar minus mu. Now, that mu is coming from your 
Null and alternative hypothesis. Whatever number that you put in your null hypothesis and your alternative hypothesis, that's the number that goes right there. That's what that mu is. Okay? So x bar minus mu over s divided by the square root of n. Now, you have been dealing with this for at least a couple weeks. This is the standard error. So you're going to do x bar minus mu divided by standard error. So you're going to find the standard deviation of your sample because you took data, you, you gathered some data, you found a sample mean, you also found a sample standard deviation. And so you're going to put the sample standard deviation here and you're going to divide it by the square root of your sample size, which is based on whatever your sample size was that you took as a sample. Okay? So, you're going to calculate this, and if it's a t-score, it's actually the exact same thing. It's the same formula for a t-score. This calculation will give you a number. That number is called the test statistic. That is the test statistic. And so when you have that number right here, whatever that number is, you are going to compare that number to your decision rule. Remember we just did the decision rule and we said it, uh, reject H sub O if Z is less than negative a number or if Z is greater than positive this number. And so whatever number you get here, if it satisfies the decision rule, then you're going to make a decision and you are going to say reject H sub O. That's all you're going to say is reject H sub O. Now, if you make the calculation and the number that you get here, one or the other, whether it's a Z test or a T test based on step four, if that number does not satisfy the decision rule, if it is not less than your critical Z value, if it is not greater than your critical Z value, if it's in between, then you are going to say, do not reject H sub O. Do not reject. In this case, your sample that you took, the information that you got from your sample, is not sufficient to reject the null hypothesis. When you reject the null hypothesis, you are showing support for the alternative hypothesis. You are embracing the alternative hypothesis. When you say do not reject H sub O, you are saying, you know what, this alternative hypothesis doesn't seem to be working out. We're going to stick with the null hypothesis and we're going to say that the populations are basically the same. Now, I need to warn you about something. Some people might say, well, if we reject the null hypothesis, aren't we then going to embrace the alternative hypothesis? Not exactly. And let me explain. In science, you don't do one study, find support for something, and then break out the, you know, break out the party equipment and say, yay, we found the truth. No, you didn't find the truth. Maybe you found the truth, but you don't know for sure that you found the truth. What you have now is one study one piece of evidence that shows support for your hypothesis. And what you now have to do is, you now have to go back out into the world and you need to set up a new study, maybe an experiment or something like that. And you're going to need lots and lots of different studies in different circumstances using different samples that all show support for your hypothesis before you can really, really say, we have a lot of support for this hypothesis, okay? So you have to be careful about what rejecting the null hypothesis means because there have been lots of times in history, in research, people have made their whole lives out of researching a particular idea and then after 30 years of research someone else comes along with new techniques and new methods for sampling and for doing statistics and they they just blow all that research out of the water and they find all kinds of, of uh, lack of support or support no, I shouldn't say it that way they find all kinds of evidence against this other hypothesis that somebody has supported for 30 years
Okay, so you don't don't let your head get too big once you get to this reject null hypothesis. That just means that you are on to something and it merits continued research. Okay, so this is our one sample hypothesis test, and that was step six. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to do a few examples, at least two, maybe three examples, where we go through this six-step process.